so first of all, let me introduce you to Arnold Kriegstein. He's from the University of California, San Francisco. His interest is in how the brain develops in humans and our close relatives uh, in the animal kingdom, and how this understanding is giving us new perspective on how human-specific features uh, have developed and evolved. Arnold. Oh. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And I also want to thank uh, the Royal Institute and the uh, Company of Biologists for the opportunity to speak to you here. And I also, of course, want to thank you all for coming. Uh, I realize that uh, Svante Pabo is a very uh, tough act to follow, and that's why I'm speaking first. <laughs> and my subject, as you heard, has to do with brain development. And I'd like to put that in the context of uh, evolution um, in a kind of free freewheeling way. It's, uh, it's a very uh, parochial perspective on evolution. And in the end, I hope you'll come away with at least some notion of uh, what, what is different about the human brain and its development and its position in, in, in the world of, uh, of living creatures. So I thought I would begin um, just briefly with something you're probably all aware of, uh, the size of the human brain. And in terms of primates, uh, we have the largest uh, brain. But it's not the largest brain by any means when you look at the animal kingdom broadly. Elephants, of course, have a larger brain. And not only do other creatures have larger brains, but some of them have more folded brains. So one of the characteristics of the cerebral cortex is the fact that it's highly folded, called gyrencephaly. And as you see in the right, uh, dolphins, whales, and cetacea have perhaps the most highly folded cortical surface area. So, so our brains are neither the largest nor clearly the, the most folded. Um, and in fact, if you look at this in a quantitative way, shown here among uh, living primates, uh, the human, uh, is at the very end, at the top of this chain, in terms of uh, brain size at, at to body perspective. If you add other creatures, including the cetaceans, which are shown here, uh, then the position is uh, obviously not at the top of the chain. In fact, uh, our brain is uh, about the same size as a seal brain, and in terms of folding, uh, it's much more highly folded in uh, whales and cetacea, which are actually about the same size as our brain. So even for the size of our brain, there are creatures that are uh, have uh, a much larger surface area of cortex. So that, that isn't a unique feature for us. But what about cognition? I mean, I think most of us, if asked, would, would probably point to intelligence as one of the key features. And so I wanted to just briefly talk about other uh, creatures that are smart, and in particular talk uh, in the mammalian or vertebrate lineage, uh, mammals and birds. Now, I also, before we start talking about vertebrates, I wanted to make sure you understood that there are non-vertebrates, uh, mollusks, that appeared in an evolutionary time table much, much earlier than even uh, all of these mammals, and that were really, really quite smart. And uh, one feature I just want to mention is the cephalopods, as the name suggests, are mollusks that have very large brains. And the notion of having a large brain, of having a lot of nerve cells, and uh, a variety of different types of nerve cells, is a characteristic we're going to be coming back to uh, pretty shortly. So what about birds and mammals? Uh, when it comes to most of the intelligence tests that people have used in a primate experimental biology, not with people, of course, but with non-human primates, uh, in recent years, it turns out that birds, especially uh, crows and their relatives, uh, are almost as smart, or at least uh, equivalent, in many of the skills that primates have. Uh, they have reasoning, imagination, uh, they can actually have uh, counting and quantitative memories, uh, they have social interactions, obviously, they have tool use, uh, they do a lot of problem solving. And, uh, if you design the experiment correctly, these birds can be extremely smart, as most of you probably know. And, and there are birds that can mimic uh, speech and uh, have been trained in a, in a whole range of ways that really very closely resemble what you can do with uh, dogs or with, uh, with monkeys. So I just wanted to spend a few minutes talking about what might make uh, birds as, uh, as smart as they appear to be. Bird brain is on the left, the human brain is on the right. And the classic view was that the cortex, the cerebral cortex of the bird, was really quite minuscule. It's shown in this diagram here in green, if you can see that little cap. Um, and that was the classic view until relatively recently. And what's happened recently is that in studies mostly on the mouse, markers have been developed. And what a marker is, it's basically a protein that's expressed by a particular cell type against which you can raise an antibody and then label it in some way. So it can be used as a marker for a particular protein found in particular cell types. And when those markers were applied to birds recently, it's turned out that the areas of the cerebral cortex of the bird that are anatomically similar to the cortex of, of mammals 
uh, also express the cell types that you find in the mammalian cortex. So the revised version is shown here on the lower left, where this area in green is now thought to represent the cerebral cortex of the bird. So, you know, this bird brain has really changed in our thinking from something that had very little cerebral cortex to something that really has a great deal. And not only is it larger, and our understanding of it at least has changed, but the cell types that are found in the cortex uh, turn out to also be very revealing. And so on the right-hand panels, let me start with these. The colors, the green and the red, are fluorescent markers, but they've been uh, tagged to antibodies that label particular cell features or cell types found in the mammalian cerebral cortex, the mouse cortex, shown here on the right. And those same proteins are expressed by specific cell types found throughout the cerebral cortical region of the bird, and that's shown again here. One of the key differences is that the mammal, over here on the right, has a laminar cortex. These cells are segregated in specific layers. And those cells, same cell types are found in the bird brain in what are known as nuclei. They're clustered together, so they're not layered the same way, but they're uh, distributed nonetheless in the cerebral cortex. And if you map the circuits that connect them, they all form uh, specific kinds of circuits, those circuits actually do resemble uh, the circuits that are found in the radial dimension of mammalian cortex. So these studies are, are ongoing, and, and I have to say that it's still a, a work in progress. But the evidence is that the uh, bird brain uh, has many of the same kinds of complexities that you find in mammalian cortex. On the left, I've shown the reptile, um, in this case a turtle. And the turtle does have a laminar cortex. This has a single cell layer rather than the six layers of mammal cortex. And also has some of the same cell types that you find in mammal, but not as many, it doesn't seem, and certainly not in the same circuits. So the number of cell types, the diversity of cell types, and the circuits they form are not quite the same in, in reptiles. And I think many of you might imagine that you know, lizards, reptiles, turtles, and so on are probably not as smart as birds or, or certainly as mammals. So you know, I don't want to imply that this is exactly the cause for, for intelligence, but it seems to correlate to some extent with that. And uh, with that in mind, uh, what does it mean for dinosaurs? And I just took this little excursion for a minute because our thinking about dinosaurs has really changed enormously since I was young. Uh, they've been thought uh, to be reptiles, and, and, and so they were pictured that way, they stood that way, and they still do in many museums, especially here in, in the UK. Uh, but what it really means is this, that uh, birds are descended from reptile uh, stem ancestors, and along the way, uh, there are very familiar examples of uh, theropod dinosaurs. Now, the theropod dinosaurs are like T-Rex, the ones that had two legs and that were carnivorous. And they actually, uh, turns out, to be very much related to birds. Uh, this, again, would be the sort of lumbering T-Rex that I grew up with, uh, living in New York close to the Museum of Natural History. Uh, this is the current, current view of what these dinosaurs look like. So this is the sort of modern view of a T-Rex, a feathered dinosaur looking very much uh, like a bird. And so based on uh, the features of the brain that I'd mentioned earlier, whoops, let me just come back for a second, you can imagine that these dinosaurs, rather than being the lumbering reptiles that we used to think, uh, are really probably, or were, I should say, were probably very smart. Uh, you know, they were more like birds, they probably had social behaviors more like birds, uh, and they probably uh, were about as smart, perhaps, as, as birds. Of course, we, we can't look at the cell types in the brain, but this at least is, a, is an interesting uh, change in our thinking of, of, of those ancestors. Now, what about primates? Now, you'll be hearing about hominids uh, in a, just a little while, but I did think I should at least show you uh, this lineage uh, that goes back uh, three and a half million years uh, for humans. And what I wanted to emphasize is uh, the columns you see underneath, where uh, the modern human uh, has 88 billion uh, cells calculated in the brain, compared to these numbers for our uh, hominid ancestors. And I think that's one of the keys I want to uh, emphasize, is the number of cells in the human brain is enormous. And even though the whales, as I mentioned, and the elephants have bigger brains and more folding, they have fewer cells, because the cortex in those animals is much, much thinner than it is in our cortex. And so they actually have uh, two-thirds or less of the number of cells that we have in, in our brains. Uh, I just wanted to show some uh, footprints and emphasize that the human brain has the largest number of neurons. And so that, that gets us to the theme I, I wanted to uh, touch on next, because it's really what I do in my lab. Where do these cells come from? And what is it about the neurons in the cerebral cortex of the human that may be different than even uh, our, our near-primate relatives? And so for this, I first wanted to uh, acknowledge Ramon E. Cajal, uh, 
who is a giant who really uh, calculated, well, didn't calculate, I'm sorry, but who first uh, characterized the kinds of cells you find in human cortex as well as a whole range of other animals. And uh, started a, a process that's still ongoing, which is to try to uh, divide them up into categories or uh, classes of cells. And the problem is that we don't know yet, uh, and may never know, exactly how many different cell types there are in any brain, but a partic particularly in the human brain, where it looks like at least morphologically, uh, and that's what's shown here, the, the variety of cell shapes and, and uh, sizes and so on is really quite enormous. But on top of that, there's now molecular complexity, uh, because we now understand with the markers that I've mentioned that many of these cell types are very distinct in terms of the proteins that they express. And the question then becomes, are they different types of cells from each other? And so the answer isn't in, I couldn't tell you right now how many different cell types there are in the human brain or cortex, but it's an enormous number. And it's probably the largest uh, number of diverse cell types of any organ in the body and, and uh, any, any uh, animal uh, currently alive anyway. So the question then is, is really the heart of the research that I do in the lab, and that is how are these cells produced? How do you produce the large number of cells in the human brain, and how do you have the diverse cell types? Well, the best studied uh, model for the human development is the mouse. And so I thought I'd begin just very briefly uh, to describe what we've learned in the last decade or so about uh, neuron development in the mouse. And I should mention that this really is uh, information that was available only in the last 10 years. And uh, just to familiarize you with the movie I'm going to show you in a minute, uh, what we've done is take the brain and lopped off the front end. This is a, a, a mouse brain. And inside there is a cerebral ventricle. This is a fluid-filled cavity. And all the cells that are born in the, in the brain arise from this neuroepithelium that lines this cavity. And this neuroepithelium is what we'll show you in a minute. Uh, we take a slice of this, put it on a slide, uh, label individual cells using a retrovirus that expresses a fluorescent protein. And then we can take time-lapse images, uh, whoops, I'm sorry, over time uh, to watch uh, how these cells divide and, and migrate around. So this is... Uh, although you can't see it, the surface of that cavity, the ventricle. And this is a cell in the mouse brain that's descended to the surface of this ventricle and is now divided. Uh, you may notice it has a radial fiber, which forms these little varicosities. Uh, that fiber doesn't retract. And now the cell is moving away. And these nuclei of the cell, which is located here, goes through this oscillation called interkinetic nuclear migration. Um, but it created a daughter cell. And you can follow the daughter because it's the one with the white triangle now. And it migrates along the parental radial glial fiber. So there's this fiber along which this cell is now migrating up into the cortex. Now the parent cell, which is by the way known as a radial glial cell, is now going through a second division. Meanwhile, the first cell that was born is, is also dividing. And it's dividing not at the ventricle here, but in a different zone known as the subventricular zone, which is away from the ventricle. And when this cell divides, it has again two daughters which are identical to each other. In fact, they both turn into neurons. And this pattern of neurogenesis, where the radial glial cell, which is, by the way, now referred to as a neural stem cell, that cell goes through an asymmetric division, which means the daughters have different fates. One of those fates is to stay as a self-renewed radial glial cell, and the other fate is to become the daughter cell. So this two-step process of neurogenesis in the mouse involves the radial glial cells, which are the neural stem cells, that produce these daughter cells known as intermediate progenitors, and they divide, each one of them just once, to produce two neurons, which then migrate to the cortex. And that process goes over and over again until all the neurons are created in the cerebral cortex. And that, that's essentially how the, the neurons in the, in the surface of the brain, the cortex, uh, derive in the mouse. In humans, it starts very much the same way. So if you look at this section, which is now in the human brain, a roughly comparable age, and now we've stained this with some of those markers that I'd mentioned earlier, there is this ventricular zone lining the ventricle where the radial glial cells live, and their daughter cells are stained now in this marker that looks sort of yellow uh, or green that's on top, and that's known as a subventricular zone. And this looks just like the mouse or the rat or most mammals. Ventricular zone and subventricular zone where their radial glial cells and their daughter cells. But what we have that the mouse and rat don't have is an outer subventricular zone, this zone, which... Uh, is actually thought at one time to be primate-specific. It now turns out, because of the marker expression, that there are similar zones, although much smaller, in other mammals, which we'll talk about in a, uh, toward the end of the talk. But these cells are labeled with all these different colors because they are markers for cells that are cycling, that are actively dividing. So every one of these colored cells is actually still dividing and producing more daughter cells. Uh, 
So this huge area of proliferation doesn't exist in the mouse or the rat. And so this is the first hint that, that this is important for creating that large number of neurons that make us, I think, unique. So now I want to show you a movie of a human uh, a slice. This is treated very much the same way as that rodent that I mentioned. It's cultured in, a, in, in slices and uh, time-lapsed image. And the surface of the ventricle is down here. And what's happening in these human cells is they're undergoing interkinetic nuclear migration. You'll, if you follow some of them, you'll see them come down to the surface, divide, and then move, move away. Very much like in the mouse, but there are actually many more of them. Uh, they're dividing in a slightly different way. Some of them are dividing horizontally, some are dividing vertically, and that's actually important for creating diversity. Um, but that looks, in other ways, very similar to what happens in the mouse. What happens in the outer subventricular zone, of course, is unique because there is no outer subventricular zone in the mouse. So now we're looking at that region, which is uh, away from the ventricle. And again, we've only stained some of the cells, not all of them. But every cell in this field divides at least once in this 24-hour period. And they divide in a very characteristic way, which some of you may, may be observing. They kind of jump and divide. Uh, behavior that really hadn't been described before. Uh, and I just want to show you, whoops, maybe I'll just show it to you again, because I, I, I think it's worth paying attention to that jump. So each one of the, whoops, hold on, let me see if I can do this. There we go. Uh, yeah, there we go. So if you watch these cells, uh, they'll jump and then divide move up and then divide. And this is very different than the behavior at the ventricle where they go down to divide. And one of the, f one of the consequences of these jumping movements is that the outer subventricular zone continues to grow. It becomes more and more expanded and makes room, as it were, makes way for more of these cells as they come in later. And so these cells uh, are now referred to uh, as outer subventricular zone radioglia-like cells, or ORG cells for short, or ORG cells. And our thinking of what's different about the human compared to the mouse is the presence of these org cells, which are also a kind of neural stem cell because they give rise to neurons and then later on they give rise to glial cells, so they do more than just produce neurons. And then their daughter cells, um, the ones that they produce, are actually uh, transit amplifying cells. And, and what that term means, it's a term that's actually uh, borrowed from organ systems in other parts of the body, where daughter cells that go through multiple rounds of symmetrical division are actually amplifying cells that are all the same kind in the end. And that's what we think these daughters are, that these daughter cells go through multiple rounds of division, each time doubling their number, and in the end, they go through a terminal division where they make, each one of them makes two neurons, and then you have a huge clone of cells that goes up to the cortex. And just to describe that graphically, this is what the mouse looks like with a single radioglial cell that gives a daughter cell that produces two neurons with each cell cycle. And the human has exactly that same uh, mechanism of neurogenesis surrounding the ventricle. But then there's the additional uh, amplification out here in the outer subventricular zone where these ORG cells produce daughter cells that uh, go through multiple rounds of symmetrical division to give you a whole clone of cells. And in the end, this clone will all produce neurons in the same moment in time, the same cell cycle. And so all the cells that are born at that moment will migrate into the same cortical layer and wind up producing many, many more cells in each layer than you have in the mouse. And so we think this mechanism not only produces more neurons, but because they migrate along the radial fiber, as you noticed in that mouse movie, uh, these uh, ORG cells also deliver the cells into, colo uh, into more columns in, in the adult cortex. So, so this mechanism, we think, produces the large number of neurons. It delivers them in a columnar way into the cortex. And because each cell cycle produces a different type of progenitor, we think differs from the cell in the cycle that comes later or the one that came before, that each one of these uh, cells produces a different uh, type of neuron. And this creates the huge diversity of cell types that you find in the cortex. And this whole outer subventricular zone is not present in, in most other mammals, but it is found in, in, in species other than primates, which I'll, I'll, I'll touch on in a second. Now, the other feature I wanted to mention is the folding and how that might develop from an evolutionary perspective. And this is an experiment that was done by uh, Andrew Chen and, and Chris Walsh, who's up in Boston, where they took a mouse, and this is a, an embryonic mouse, 10 days in the embryo, and it's cut straight through the head, and these would be the eyes actually, and this is the brain. And this is what a normal 10-day-old embryonic mouse head would look like. And the brain is smooth, it's known as a lysencephalic uh, brain, and that's what the adult would have as well, the smooth surface on the brain. Now on the right is a mouse of the same age, 10 and a half days in utero, and it's had one uh, alteration, and that is that the uh, cells that are producing the neurons, the radioglial cells in this brain, have been engineered to express beta-catenin. It's a 
it's a, a, a signaling factor that's actually in the wind pathway, if any of you are familiar with the wind pathway. And this is constitutively active. That means it's continuously turned on, whereas normally it would have turned off. And by continually, continu continuously stimulating this pathway, these radioglial cells have not produced neurons or daughter in, you know, progenitor cells. They've actually just produced more and more and more radioglial cells. So this has hugely expanded the progenitor pool that is ultimately going to produce a neuron. And in the course of getting so many more cells, it's starting to fold on itself in a way that uh, is really reminiscent of the gyri or folding that occurs in creatures like the primates I mentioned, or in this case, the ferret. Now, there are differences between what's happened here and what's happened here, but I just use this as an illustration of how a, a single gene alteration, a single mutation, uh, could produce a, a dr dramatic change in phenotype like this. And there probably were uh, mutations, maybe not this mutation, but similar types of mutations that accounted for the large folding that we see, and, and more than the folding, the large expansion that I've just described in neuron production. Now, the main orders of, uh, of mammals, which are shown here, the four of them, uh, all have species, and some of them are shown here on the right, that have folded brains. And so, for instance, at the top we have the ferret, which is a carnivore. Uh, capybara, some of you may be familiar with, is a large South American rodent. Most rodents, like the mouse, have a smooth brain, but uh, this is a large rodent, and it has a folded brain. Uh, humans, of course, are a good example of primates, and the elephant that I mentioned earlier, which is very highly folded. So these are all called gyrencephalic brains, and we now know that uh, all of them really have these ORG cells that I've just described in various numbers, but at least have some of them represented in early cortical development. And the point I want to make is that every one of these orders also has uh, species that are smooth-brained or lysencephalic. So the brown bat is a uh, carnivore that actually is lysencephalic or smooth. Uh, most rodents, like the mouse, are smooth-brained. Uh, the Senegal bush baby and the marmoset and a few others are primates that actually have smooth or lysencephalic cortex. And the manatee is actually very closely related to the elephant. Uh, it's not entirely smooth, but compared to the elephant, it is. It's a, a, essentially very, very uh, smoother, much smoother than the elephant. And so it turns out that, in fact, some of these uh, creatures have lost folding in evolution, and some of them have gained it. So it's quite plastic. It, it's not as though animals are continuously getting bigger and bigger and the cortex is getting more complicated. There are at least some examples where it's become more simplified or at least reduced. And no one really understands why this folding occurs. It certainly can allow a larger cortical... Uh, sheet to be fitted into a smaller brain, and that's usually the explanation that's given. But we still don't understand the mechanisms for folding, and we don't really understand uh, how that evolved, and, and, and maybe some of these examples represent uh, parallel uh, examples of evolution. But whatever it is, it's not uh, the consequence of these ORG cells. So having that mechanism of neurogenesis that I mentioned is uh, necessary but not sufficient to produce a uh, folded cortical brain. And so the summary I wanted to leave you with are the features that are and are not unique. So the human cerebral cortex, as I would mentioned, is certainly not the largest brain in, in the animal kingdom or uh, is not the most folded, as, as I showed you before. But it does contain the largest number and diversity of cell types. And, uh, and I think that's probably what accounts for many of the uh, human unique uh, behavioral features that you're all familiar with, including the uh, cognitive abilities that, that we all have. Um, and... Uh, it's not the only explanation. The, along with more cells and more diverse cell types are more complicated circuits. And the cortical circuits are very important. And when it comes to diseases like schizophrenia and autism and so on, uh, it's those complicated circuits that go awry that are probably mostly responsible for that. So the large number of cells, uh, the diverse types, and the circuits they form are features that, uh, that I think are going to be unique. Uh, they're starting to look that way already uh, in human uh, brain development and function. And uh, with that, I'd, I'm happy to take questions, and uh, we can hear from uh, Svante about uh, hominid evolution. <laughs>